Welcome to Calcedon Podcast number 35. Today is June 25th, 2023. I'm Andrea Schwartz, and I'm joined by Calcedon President Mark Rush Juni and Calcedon Vice President Martin Sobretti. Evil has been a reality since the fall. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus directs us to petition the Father to deliver us from evil or the evil one. When biblical law is marginalized or abandoned, evil takes on an arrogance, whereby those who are evil demand that those who oppose them be denied the right to do so. In other words, they become the standard of any value judgment on themselves. Mark, back in 1980, your dad wrote an essay entitled The Arrogance of Evil. In it, he juxtapositioned the call for human rights over the call for obedience to God's law. Explain what happens when this, is, when this occurs. What's the result? My father spoke a lot about humanism because he saw humanism as essentially what was happening in the temptation to uh, Adam and Eve when uh, Satan told Eve that they could be as God's knowing good and evil, as determining good and evil for yourself. I often compare humanism to sort of a, a, an organizational chart of sinful man. Uh, we're familiar with organizational charts. Who's the, 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 the CEO? Who are the vice presidents? Who are the heads of different departments and so forth? It's a structure of authority. And we see God as supreme over all. Humanism basically, in one way or another, seeks to remove God as the source of authority and replace him uh, with man. And so when man does that, he becomes the uh, de facto authority. Uh, whether it's stated in such blunt terms or not, man is basically said to be and, or considered to be in charge. And, and so this is the, the essence of humanism, man replacing uh, God, because you have to have ultimate authority. There's going to be ultimacy uh, in any system. And when man becomes the authority, he wants deference to uh, his way. And therefore, there's there's an arrogance to this sort of evil. We're very familiar with the very evil, wicked men, institutions, and movements, and their and the the type of arrogance that it is displayed because they're basically flaunting what God says, and they sometimes have open contempt for biblical morality because they believe that it is just a creation of evolutionary man that really religion is a very very late comer to the evolutionary process so therefore they see themselves as the pioneers of evolution and so there's an arrogance whenever you say um in response to the word of god but i think and that's really what he's getting at, the inherent arrogance of any uh, defiance of the authority, power, and revealed word of God. I see. Okay. So usually the call is for freedom, for liberty. So Martin, under humanism, uh, freedom is defined as the ability to do whatever you want. And of course, that works until an elite decides that they're going to decide what everybody should want, and they, redef they redefine freedom. So how did Western civilization, or Christendom, lose the upper hand in this? How did God's law word, which used to be at least acknowledged, now got to be to the point where people have to defend even suggesting that it's something that should be followed? It's interesting that you start your conversation with the discussion of liberty and freedom because there was a time when the law of god was equated as the pathway to liberty uh after all it says as much in psalm 119 you know and that uh, liberty because i seek thy precepts uh I mean, walk in a wide space if you will as david says in that psalm and we've lost sight of that notion that it's the source of liberty so when the law of god is no longer uh, treated as uh 
our walking orders, then the anchor of liberty is going to be something else. It's going to be the word of man rather than the word of God. And unfortunately, the word of man invariably enslaves and tyrannizes because uh, you have what Dr. Rushdie talks about in the law, uh, law and liberty, is that the ultimate authorities now are on the same level as you are, and they're crowding out your ability. So you have too many gods at the same level, all in contention, and therefore it becomes a battle of strength. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> the larger collectives and the larger wars, uh, uh, warriors are going to be the ones that prevail under this authority. Uh, so once in God's law, you relax your willingness to embrace it, to teach it, to propagate it, to extol it, then you're going to be embracing and extolling man and his authority. And then you end up with what B.F. Skinner says. He says, we cannot afford to have freedom. We need to take control because you know, since we want to have a specific goal in mind for history, and that's what ultimate authorities are concerned with, where is history going to go? Uh, that cannot be achieved through human freedom, which is capricious, as it turns out, when it's uh, cut loose from the law of God or from all moral concerns. And uh, consequently, people like B.F. Skinner say we need to curtail freedom. We need to say that's a luxury we can no longer afford. It was a myth in the past, and it's the only way to get there humanistically is to take control. And in, because they don't have a doctrine of divine providence, whereas the law of God speaks of God's providence continually, uh, that means that that divine providence is replaced with what? Human control. Now, it sounds very glowing when we say man must take control of man. That sounds and can be made to be very noble sounding, but it boils down to one man must take control over another man, and now we're back to tyranny. And we're told that we need to accept this because the future requires it. So now men are going to be told to live something greater than themselves, but it won't be God. It'll be this idea of man and man's goal as dictated by the elite. And now we're back to the philosopher kings of Plato, because we're repeating things that have long since played out in history, and they don't die because people's willingness to rebel against God has not yet died. There's still rebellion and depravity to be extinguished down here. The law of God gives us a transcript of how that might occur um, and the terms under which God requires us to walk. But man, being arrogant, chooses his own path, uh, and he doubles down on his rebellion because he has uh, taken his godship, his godhood, and put it over and above the literal God. See, it's always going to be a question of who is at the apex of authority. And that's where the word arrogant you know, has these roots in terms of arrogating power to yourself, arrogating authority, arrogating rank to yourself. These are all examples of arrogance as a matter of seizing or usurping power. Something that Jesus does not do. He did not uh, try to seize power, even though he was equal with God, as Philippians tells us. But men are the, exactly that. They seize power. And one way they do it is to seize power over other men. And therefore, liberty is on the chopping block because the mechanism for it has been lost. The church has become antinomian. And like we always say here, if uh, moral reality abhors a vacuum, if you remove God's law, then men's, the precepts of men must rush in and take that place. And it may not necessarily be the precepts of good men. <laughs> it might be the precepts of very evil men. Uh, in fact, that tends to dominate because they're more forceful in seeing their position uh, carried out and implemented because they have the means. Fortunately, because God is real and the true Lord, uh, he sees uh, that all their plans come to naught. Uh, they are like the dust of the balance, as Isaiah says, and less than nothing and vanity. But they don't think so. But when God gives this registry of all the things that are hilarious about their arrogance, men still double down. And therefore, great is their fall, because that Tower of Babel will also fall. There's another historic example, one of the great examples of arrogance. We'll build a tower to heaven and become like God. And man continues to build, build, build with newer mechanisms, newer technologies, newer levels of alleged intelligence, but not moral intelligence, because it's been severed from the law of God. And that's the church's fault, because the law was given to the church to propagate, to expand on God's word, and to send it forth. The law shall go forth, as it says in Isaiah 2, and that's on us. And if we don't send the law forth, then substitutes for the law will come back in place. And that's the church's fault for its dereliction. All right. So one of these um, replacements, Mark, would be self-realization. People want to realize their full potential. And oftentimes what's sold to them as a solution for that is that you can be all that you can be. And it sounds remarkably like. Satan's temptation 
to to Eve. But do you think that a lot of the modern church, whether it's the modernist church or evangelical or even in some reform spheres, are looking more to be self-actualized and self-realized than they are to serving God and for the, furthering the kingdom? I think it's inevitably a part of, of this uh, humanism's elevation of man as authority that uh, individuals want to see what's how does that benefit me? And of course, that was the temptation to Adam and Eve. Ye shall be as gods. Uh, and so this idea of uh, moral anarchism, moral rebellion against God and the legitimizing of that rebellion uh, appeals to the individual. And even when men propose other means of authority, such as statism, there's always that element of self-interest. And so this idea of what's in it for me, this is good for me, this is good for, for my lawlessness and my ability to exist without the, the dictates of a biblical uh, ethic or a biblical worldview uh, this all you know come comes into play very, very definitely and we see that prominently uh, i always try to remind people that when we speak of humanism we're not speaking that of rebellion against god as a monolithic and a, a single argument and course of activity it's just the opposite when men run away from God, they run away in many different directions. Humanism is not a unity. It's just the fact that it's anti-God and proposing some other uh, authority. So we would say that uh, the uh, screaming moral anarchist is really in the same humanistic camp as the ruling member of a communist party in, in China. They are all trying to do things outside the authority of God and claiming uh, the the right to do so. So men run away from God in many different directions, but there are common elements. And this idea that there's something in it for me, what's in it for me is the perception that they are escaping God. And this is something that God periodically, often in Scripture, if you look, read the prophets, says, and when the prophets start saying, thus saith the Lord, and they're quoting God, I'll destroy you. I'm going to cut you off. In other words, God is saying, do what you will. I'm going to have my way. And this is really the message of Christianity, is that this isn't going to work. And when my father wrote on humanism, it was to that effect that we've tried this before, and it never works. It's not going to work. Not only is it not going to morally work as a means of rebelling against God, but it's also going to be self-destructive for you as individuals. It's going to be destructive for your culture. It's going to be destructive of civilization. And therefore, you know, the gospel points people to Christ and his kingdom. Because remember, the, the gospel we, we often forget was called the gospel of the kingdom of God in Scripture. The, the gospel doesn't just lead us to the early gates. The gospel leads us to a life uh, beyond that gate and a life on the straight and narrow. And it gives meaning and purpose and direction to our life, family life, community life. You should also add that uh, when we talk about self-realization and things on this order, what is being rejected here, by and large, is the servant model that is at the heart of Scripture. And so really, John Milton nailed it when he put in Satan's mouth the simply notion that better to rule in hell than to serve in heaven. Because at least you're ruling, even if it's hell that you're ruling. So men seem to think the same way. They would rather be ruling in their own personal hells because they're in charge than to serve in God's heaven or in God's kingdom, whatever shape that might take in their generation. Uh, and consequently, uh, when we we have notions that Mark just appealed to the prophets, I see that in Isaiah 
uh, third chapter, there is a phrase about let this ruin be under your hand. So at that point, we have the disaster of self-determination being realized, but at least you're in control of it, right? Uh, and it is a pyrrhic victory for man always to win his battle, uh, to have things his way and, and to be numero uno and to rule in his personal hell, because the hell it is. It's not the heaven that they're pretending to make. And the more they get to speak about it, the more hellish it becomes. And more they're trying to convince us that that's the right path forward. Uh, and that's because uh, the praying principle is that we don't want to serve God. That is the one anathema. That's the one curse. That means that man is denied to be man. In when Dr. Rishtuni wrote The Revolt Against Maturity, he says man uh, in the humanistic notion is not fully man unless he's trampling God's law underfoot and spitting in God's face in essence. Then he's really realizing his true potential as a, uh, as a godling, if you will, someone who can uh, look God in the eye and say no and get away with it. Well, unfortunately, that's not the case. Uh, this is a fiction. It's a fiction that continues to be propagated throughout culture because it has a certain power to those who are willing to be manipulated uh, and have itching ears. Essentially, this is an itching ears problem because people want to consider that maybe they're in charge that they don't have to answer to anybody else, least of all a God, and therefore this God is worthy to be mocked and ridiculed, to be denied entirely as if he exists, and if he did exist, he's not relevant to us, which is even worse in a way than to say that he doesn't exist. He said, well, if he does exist, he's, no, he's nothing to me. The sad fact is that there will be a comeuppance in all these cases. We might have power, as Dr. Rishwani said, but we don't have true authority. Uh, and until we decide that we're going to serve the living God, uh, as opposed to ourself, uh, and be self will be, we can become God oriented, then the picture changes. But what happens now is that humanism has taken charge, at least of the public uh, mechanisms and instruments and institutions for education. So their message is being pounded into the skulls of all these children. So they learn by example and by precept that uh, there is no God and that the highest authority is, the, is man. And usually that translates into man in the collective, man is state, statist man. And therefore, you always default to tyranny because statism, in order to make good on its alleged promises, uh, must continue to accrue more and more power, which means uh, take more and more freedom. And man becomes less than a man in his effort to become more than man. Okay, so you're talking, Martin, about the culture that rejects God. But I see a lot of these attitudes inside the church with people who will profess Christ, and yet they're very comfortable sort of um, being syncretistic with the culture. In other words, whether they think it won't touch them because they now say, well, we're not under condemnation, or they think they're going to be rescued out of it. So you don't really have a vibrancy with these people, and they sort of get comfortable in the middle. What's the remedy for that? Well, Part of the problem is, uh, I think Dr. Shri would have argued this too, that that middle spot is the lukewarm spot. And ultimately, you get vomited out of Christ's mouth in, in that position uh, when you all things are permissible and we can safely mix these kind of false pagan notions with Christianity. The whole point, I think, of Dr. Shri's book, The Chariots of Prophetic Fire, is the battle against syncretism how it continued to play out in Israel's history, both the northern and southern kingdoms uh, were continually plagued by this notion. And we only had a handful of kings that headed the wrong different direction. And sometimes we had Levites, it's an amazing phrase in the, the Chronicles, that there's a time when the Levites were more upright in heart than the priests. In other words, you couldn't look to the priesthood for biblical purity and actually holding the line on what God requires you had to go to level down the servants of the, Le the Levites being more upright in heart than the priests. And that might be what we're facing today, is that the so-called priests and a lot of the um, movers and shakers in the church, they, uh, again, appeal to itching ears. They have a message that becomes popular. They know exactly how to paint the picture, uh, how to bait the hook, I would call it, and to attract people to it. Because we already, if we have a predisposition to want to hear that, then we're going to be inclined to teachers that agree with our existing inclinations. And those inclinations are wayward and crooked, then we're going to be in, in serious trouble. And that's exactly what the church is doing. 
So uh, if the church is not calling out syncretism, if it tolerates it or even promotes it, then, of course, that church is going to be bypassed. I think we're going to see a lot of candlesticks being removed out of their place simply because of this lukewarm effect. And uh, the essence of being lukewarm is it starts off hot and then cools down. And part of that cooling down process is the intermixture of false faiths, of humanism. And what humanism does is make it uh, enticing to do it. It, it. it looks like an appealing package. It, they don't package humanism as a foul-smelling cesspool. No one would accept it if it said that way. No, it's set forth as the highlight of man's being. That this makes total sense to not be dogmatic about X, Y, or Z. We should be uh, liberty-minded, quote-unquote, about these various things. And, of course, this is an area where God may not be liberty-minded at all, where dogmatic means something. It reminds me of a message that uh, Dr. Warfield wrote on the dogmatic spirit. And he didn't treat dogmatic as a negative. Rather, it uh, he shows that Paul was promoting the idea uh, that we must hold to the truth because the truth is a sacred deposit that we must cling to at all cost because it was purchased with the blood of the saints. And Christ has also given us this charge, as was Timothy. And to us, falls the duty to protect it and to propagate it and to teach it faithfully and to walk in it. And if there are those who are against it, we've already been told that it's going to be a message that's opposed and supposed because it challenges all authority that is not anchored on the one foundation, which is Christ. Yes. So, Mark, um, recently Chalcedon made available to its readership your father's commentary on the minor prophets Zephaniah, Haggai, and Zechariah. And I have to highly recommend them. When my husband and I were going through them, it's like, oh, this is a slap in the face. I mean, Dr. Rush Juni just slapped us in the face again in terms of let's really take a look at where we're at. And one of the things he brings up is that over time, the church, the people of God can have a flippant attitude towards God. You know, hey, we did this right. Now you should bless us everywhere. And especially in the, the book of Haggai, it's like, no, that's not the way it works. Talk a little bit about how God wants us to be obedient, but doesn't want us to stop at the letter A and then say we're all good. One of the problems we have in the, the modern church with uh, reading the Bible is because we tend to think of our Bible knowledge in terms of very one-dimensional presentations, such as, oh, yes, I remember that from Sunday school. I've heard that story. And there, in Sunday school, there was unfortunately a strong term to just cut it down to a, a simple lesson, understandable to a child as sort of a, a something to walk away from the Sunday school lesson uh, with. And it became, so the Bible stories became sort of like uh, Christian Aesop fables, where let's reduce this to a character lesson. Let's reduce this story to a morality tale. Let's re- just reduce that to its basics. And we don't see the broad aspect. You know, life was as, in many ways, as complicated. Not, I'm not talking about technology, but life was as involved and complicated and as it is today. And we don't like people coming in and, and giving us a, a one-sentence morality tale to describe our life or any given situation we're in. It's always more complicated than that. And you have to remember when the prophets preached, and they preached over a period of several hundred years, Israel had been in the land, but they were increasingly becoming apostate. Uh, first, the, af, after Solomon, the kingdom split into two nations, Israel and Judah. Israel quickly went into Baal worship, thoroughly apostate. Even Israel never rejected Jehovah outright. They adopted these other Baals as as legitimate powers they worshiped them and jehovah was just considered to be another power another baal so so to speak but they never repudiated him and they thought that this was 
somehow legitimate. They were actually that thought that they were becoming more sophisticated in their in their uh, uh, in their religion. God condemned them. It took a long time, but God destroyed them, scattered them, and then Judah that had been a morally a little better, a little bit more orthodox. It had good periods and bad, bad periods, it, but it went down the same road. By the time of Jeremiah, Isaiah and Jeremiah, they were far gone. Uh, by the time of Jeremiah, they were com- completely gone and, and thoroughly apostate. There was very little faith left in Israel. And uh, over 2 million people went from the wilderness wanderings into to Palestine. And yet after the Babylonian captivity, about 40,000 came back. So there were a lot of ups and downs in their history. And the theme of the prophets was throughout, this isn't going to work. Rebellion is not going to get you. God is going to cut you off. God can continue his promised blessings through a remnant. Are you part of the remnant? Are you part of the faithful? And are you part of the future? Or are you part of that which is going to get cut off? And this is a recurring theme in in the prophets. It'd be doing anyone well to to read carefully through uh, the prophets. And a lot of it's a little confusing because there's a lot of cities and peoples and so forth that you're really, really not very familiar with. But you get the point that they're they're warning people that this isn't going to pan out well, and it didn't. It ended up in the destruction not only of Israel, but also the destruction of the nation of Judah, the destruction of Solomon's temple. The entire city of Jerusalem was destroyed, and it was in rubble for a couple generations until it was rebuilt. And but God did bring back a remnant, and. God destroyed Jerusalem again in AD 70, but we are the remnant, and we have now been promised a power, a special power, the power of the Holy Spirit that will advance the kingdom of heaven, and we have to believe that. So there's there's no reason for us to fail to learn from this lesson that God is going to have his way, his purposes are going to advance with or without us. It's not dependent on us. We're dependent upon him. And the extent to which we're faithful, regardless of our our person, what happens to us personally, is going to determine whether we're part of God's future or whether we're part of God's judgment. And uh, so this is the message that, you know, that, that is in the prophets, and it needs to be our message today, because our culture is in crisis hundreds of years of enlightenment humanism and its philosophy is is coming to a head in the next few generations, perhaps sooner. And we're seeing the collapse of of, uh, that motif. And so I think things are primed for a huge change and we need to be part of that change. And uh, that's really what the message of Christian Reconstruction is, is to start building now, be part of the faithful remnant now. Don't wait for the collapse, but but uh, start teaching men to be part of that, that, that faithful remnant. Andrea, you draw attention to the idea that, okay, we've done X, Y, or A, B, and C already. That should be good enough. Let the blessings flow. And then you mentioned Haggai specifically, and I think that's an interesting point to discuss because at the time, the people had laid down the foundation timbers for the temple, but then they went to worry about their own houses, their own sealed houses, and they let the temple uh, foundation timbers rot as a consequence as they pursued their own uh, personal needs and left God's house uh, unfinished, uncompleted. And so now the mystery to them is how is it that we plant a lot, but we're not harvesting much? And how come the yields are so low? And how come we have a hole in our purse? And God says exactly why they have it is because they prioritize their own material without finishing God's work. That they had neglected to complete what they had started. You know, they made a good finish, a good beginning. But it'd be good, but there was no follow through, and consequently, 
gods was set aside as less of a priority than their own personal needs as they saw it. And these particular curses upon God, you know, lack of rain, drought, things on this order, weren't going to be ameliorated until they took the first steps to begin rebuilding again. They had to go back into the forests and acquire the, the lumber and start the process again. At that point, God lifts the, the curse that had been placed upon them for failing to rebuild it properly. So sometimes we get off to a very big, good beginning. Dr. Rastuni, I think this is his phrase many times throughout his books. There is a good beginning, but there wasn't the follow through. And, uh, and here we see an example in scripture where exactly that happened. They had a good beginning. It was a significant enough beginning that people were weeping about the size of the temple because they could tell from the, the timber how big the new building was going to be. And it wasn't going to match Solomon's in glory. But nonetheless, it was going to be God's house where the Son of God himself would visit. So it was going to be an important place, but they weren't finished building it. They just let it sit there and let the weather have its way, uh, wear and tear on the wood timbers that made up the foundation. And so, too, many times we find ourselves in a place where we've done X, Y, or Z and figured, or let the blessings flow, but we leave the work undone. And we might be hearing a message like the rich young ruler heard, one thing you've left undone. And, mm -hmm. uh, and it, sometimes that's the pivotal thing that makes the difference. Uh, because with God, it's, it's, it's pretty much all or nothing that we deal with him. Uh, he rewards the effort. He rewards when we return and do the right thing. But if we're suddenly sitting on our lees and are slothful, we're not going to get anywhere. right? Because it's handed the diligent that shall bear rule. If we're not going to be diligent in completing the task. We will not bear rule. Our enemies will bear rule over us. And that's what happens when Christians sit on their uh, behinds and warm the pews. But God doesn't is, interested, is not interested in warm pews. He's interested in fire in the hearts. And that's a very different thing because fire in the hearts then leads to action. A warm pew can simply mean a place where you can snooze a bit, especially if the sermons are snoozeworthy rather than inspiring to action. Uh, and all theology is supposed to be geared toward action. And the only action that Israel was enjoying at the time Hag Haggai 1 was written was dealing with their own homes. That was the focal point. My little castle matters. God's castle doesn't matter because he's God. He can take care of his own castle, but he'd appointed them to rebuild it for him and to glorify him and signify uh, his lordship over them by doing that. And they, that they decided that it was safe to neglect. After all, what's the worst that could happen if we slow down on the construction? Well, they soon found out. Oop, no more rain. Oop, not the, har the harvests aren't coming in. Uh-oh, hole in the purse. When my money goes in, but uh, when I go to look at it again, it's not all there. I've lost it somehow. That's God's providential action against those who were to be diligent, but instead were slothful. And that's why we read in Matthew 25, the wicked and slothful servant, because slothfulness is a moral failure. And so sometimes we think it's neutral or not a big deal, but it's a big deal to God because he appointed us to work. And he works, then we were to work too. Uh, that's part of the image of God in us. And if we fail to do what he's called us to do, especially for his kingdom's sake, and there's no higher thing. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, then we should be building it. And if, if we're not, then, of course, we're seeking first our own kingdom. And we're back to the whole point of the arrogance of sin, putting ourselves first in front of God. Okay. So, Mark, we don't have a temple to rebuild. That's not our challenge today. But do you think there's a relationship between, instead of putting emphasis on having the foundation be God's law word that people look for maybe quicker resolutions. And so they focus on the political and they think, oh, well, the next election is coming up. We have to deal with it, but they're not really looking at it in terms of their taking care of their own house and neglecting the things that God says to do. Cause I know a lot of well-meaning people get lost in this. You know, it's always the next election. It's always the next office holder. Can we fall into the trap of thinking God will bless us and vindicate us ex against our enemies and miss the fact that God's not in the business of vindicating us? Right. It's, it's very easy for us to get sidetracked in, in what we're doing and even lose sight of uh, the original intent uh, of a project. And perhaps we never really focused and, and understood that original intent. And, and we, we do this just because we tend to be um, so fallible that we, we narrow down to the steps in front of us without sometimes knowing where we're going. Sometimes if you have a, you know, even a home improvement project, you kind of, 
lose your way and, and then decide this was a, I should have done this before I did that, that this is a cosmetic thing. And we really should have done this, this first. Well, we do that too in Christian activity. We decide something's a good idea. Therefore, we pursue that idea with it without we examining why are we doing this and are we actually on the correct course to do that? Because a lot, a lot of people who, who started you know, Christian schools, that, that was really a, a form of Christian reconstruction is starting a Christian school. But in managing a Christian school, sometimes just the management of, of running an organization so consumes you, 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 it's easy to forget why you're there. And so some, you know, Christian schools, it wasn't easy for them to, to lose their way. And, uh, or when there was a change of administration, you know, who knows what they're doing? Who's, who's an organizer? And let's get the organizer to run things. And they may not even have the, the worldview that was really, that started the, the school or the organization to begin with. So yes. And, and, uh, we sometimes look at, at quick fixes like politics is a, is an obvious one. Or we think that uh, this one particular avenue is going to do wonders for the kingdom uh, of God because we're so excited that we can accomplish something. We figure that accomplishment is obviously something that is going to be important for the kingdom. And this is why we, I like the term Christian reconstruction. People have suggested we dispense with it. But it's it's important because it says so much. And my father brought up the, the illustration of Reconstruction in an essay he wrote in 1965, one of the first Calcede reports, I believe it was the second one. And it's such a good analogy, it, it, it stuck because a Reconstruction means you have to systemically look at what you are reconstructing and evaluate it. You don't just take a building with a poor foundation and start painting it. Uh, you have to analyze what is solid here, what can be preserved, what needs to be reconstructed, and what is the best things. And so where are the basics here that need to be addressed? And Christian Reconstruction is still dealing with the basics. And one of the basics is how we go about it. And theonomy is is very, very important, is very necessary. It's the means of Christian reconstruction. And that's why I think perhaps the most discouraging thing I see in, in the church today is their attitude towards uh, theonomy and the attitude that this is just something the church needs to debate within itself. Do we really have to do this? And rather than seeing it as the way to serve the Lord, that these are actually the, the, the master's uh, instructions in his absence. This is how we build. And uh, so, yes, we tend to be short-sighted and lose sight of the big picture. And the part of the problem of losing sight of the big picture is, is uh, questions of, of eschatology or uh, the church's eschatology is all over the place and sometimes it's very short-sighted so if you have a short-sighted eschatology you're going to have your uh, methodology of getting from here to there is going to be very short-sighted and not long-term right martin you love to quote isaiah eight twenty to the law and the testimony which is sort of what mark is saying that if we're not going to build it on a foundation of god's law how do we return people to this approach to God? That we don't have to be innovative. We don't have to give God our new good idea. We have to use the tools that we've been given. Um, what would you say in terms of somebody says, I get it. Okay, I've been trying to do this in my own strength, or we've been trying to do this in our own strength. How do we apply Isaiah 820 to this rebuilding or reconstruction? Right. Well, the essence of that, uh, as we understand it, is that if it's from the law and the prophets, the law and the testimony, then applying those words brings light. In other words, uh, it actually has a positive effect. 
uh, because they are God's words and they're going to operate the way God has sent them. His word goes forth and it prospers in the thing where he sent it. And otherwise, you have a no dawn in them. If they are, do not appeal to this, if they appeal to humanism or something that is simply concocted out of the mind of man, uh, then that's a council of darkness. There is no light of dawn in them. The sun does not even begin to rise, if you will. And so you have a council of darkness and increasing darkness as a, as a consequence. If your problem is darkness, the answer is more darkness. And so by appealing to the word of God and with apo- without apology, it's they, the, the people who perpetrate, perpetrate and inflict darkness on us that should be apologizing. We shouldn't apologize for bringing in the light. The psalmist says, the entering in of thy words bringeth light. And we want to bring God's light to bear so that we can know where to walk, right? And that's why the law of God is a light unto my, a lamp unto my feet, et cetera, et cetera. So it can light the way and show which, so we don't stumble. We stay on the straight path rather than crooked and veering off into different directions. But what happens is that too many people are saying, we don't need to have God's word. We have much better words from men. Uh, and uh, they're very wise, intelligent men, and they're very compelling, and et cetera, et cetera. We have to realize that, and Dr. Van Til made this point. I said, our task is to testify, testimony. It's not that we need to reason them because the God's going to do all the work. What we need to do is actually proclaim the word because it's not going to be, as Paul says, through uh, eloquence that the battle is going to be won, but by unleashing the word of God. Even if the delivery vehicle, which might be you or me or some other Christian speaking it, is uh, a humble uh, nobody, but if you're speaking God's words, then that light is still a certainty. It doesn't matter how humble and powerless you are. If it's God's words you're speaking, then God is speaking through you into that situation. And then people, that testimony has a power and an effect. It's supernatural effect. Because that's why Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. They're not just vibrations in the air. There's something more to them. And that's also true for the law of God. It purifies the soul, purges the soul. We read a whole list of interesting things about the word of God in Psalm 19. Uh, and that's one of the things. It's, it's, it's powerful, living and powerful. And we should not hesitate to go to that through the law and the testimony. And that's almost like a call, like to your tents, O Israel. This is a call to the law and the testimony. Head that direction. Use this. Appeal to that. Seize upon that. Cling to it. Embrace it and make it yours and then pass it on. And one way you can pass it on is not just to speak it, but also to apply it. You know, so-called lighting a flame in the middle of the darkness. I, I know some ministries that are very, very humble, but what they do is they say, we're going to take this little small area and we're going to apply God's law to it. It might be a specific law, like a poor tithe, for example, and uh, something that's transformative. And then people see that, and they want to see that replicated again. And so the law of God has given a chance to show itself that the word of God is powerful and transforming. And when it's, when, when we apply it faithfully, then God honors the result, and we get the 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold increase upon it, if you will. But not if we're going to do things man's way. At that point, then God blows upon it. And great is the fall of the house that fails to build according to God's pattern, but to our own pattern. So what we're really do, saying is uh, what David Chilton had said in his little essay, the case of the missing blueprints. There is a set of blueprints for our lives, uh, for the lives of the entire world. The problem is that very few people want to use those blueprints. They want to substitute their own set of blueprints or blueprints that some other authorities have concocted and say, this is the way we should go into the future. And all these other mechanisms do not deliver a future other than one in which everyone is it's hell on earth. They don't, it's not what the marching orders or the recruitment brochure for those worldviews have, but that's what they're going to end up. Whereas the law of God alone delivers from all these things that sin uh, inflicts upon us, that we inflict, inflict upon one another. Uh, and so there's God has set a path. And through the faithful Christian who's been saved by the gospel of Christ with the atoning blood of Jesus, he's set free from the curse of the law, then he can start to apply the law faithfully and show others how to do it. And that has an evangelical effect. Dereshwin even drew attention to this when he commented on John 7, 17 in his book, The Gospel of John, that at that point, obedience precedes belief and faith. He says, walk this way, and then you'll know if the doctrine is true or not. And uh, that's kind of a profound way. It inverts things the way we're used to doing things. That's okay because God is in the process of upending everything that is opposed to his kingdom. Whatsoever thing that God hath not planted shall be uprooted, we're told in Matthew 15, 13. 
And so everything that's not built on the word of God is on sand and it's shifting sand as all humanism, humanism invariably is. And therefore it's not going to last. Whatever humanism says is right today will be wrong tomorrow. And whatever humanism says is wrong tomorrow will be even more wrong a week from now because it's a moving target. Only the word of God is solid and uh, you can rest the entire universe on the backs of it. And that's what we need to do. We need to be extolling it, need to be magnifying it. And this is how important it is to magnify it. And I think it's in Psalm 138 where God says, I, uh, I have magnified my word above my name. It's a profound thing, where as important as the name of God is, because we're told to hallow it and to not uh, profane it. He says, I have magnified my word above my name. And so if that's God's attitude toward his word, it should definitely be our attitude towards God's word. We should serve nothing less than what God sets as a standard. So you know, all these attacks, it's a paper pope, et cetera, et cetera, simply show that they think it's a dead word to begin with, whereas it's a living and active. And that's the, the thing that makes it effective, is that it's truly the word of God. So, Mark, evil is going to remain arrogant. What stops the arrogance of evil? Is it humility? Is it meekness? How is it that the Christian, when it looks as though, you know, the world powers and, and they're all organized and maybe some of the conspiracies are actually true. And so we're up against all this. What is the characteristic of righteousness? If arrogance is the characteristics of evil, what's the characteristic of righteousness? Well, humility in, in one word, but it's the humility to obey God and to take God at his word when that is increasingly difficult. And this is uh, one of the reasons we have so much history of Israel in the Old Testament, because it's it's an example to us of how they be they became consumed by the cultures around them, ending up as Baal worshippers before the fall of Jerusalem. And they rationalized this as though they had not rejected Jehovah, even though they they actually had, but they they in their own thinking they retained him. And the prophets even mentioned that, yes, you're going on with the temple uh, sacrifices and things going on the same in the temple, but they were bell, bell worshipers, which was a very vulgar fertility cult. And there's, there's an arrogance to man and how he justifies disobeying God. And we see that not just in the, in the, the grosser elements of rebellion in, in our culture, we see that sometimes in the church today, and we have to look for that in ourselves when we we rationalize why we aren't obeying God. And the church has done that in different ways theologically, sometimes with uh, you know simple um, truisms that aren't true, and so we have to be very careful. So the the opposite of arrogance of evil is pride. And where is it going to go? Specifically, we don't know. In the big picture, we know. It's going to end up in conversion, repentance, or it's going to end up in destruction. Because that's something the prophets make clear, that God's going to have his way. And if the people he has set aside won't do it, then he'll destroy that element and proceed with the, his future in in terms of the uh, remnant that he has, has is referenced several times in scripture. We also should be mindful that Jesus encountered this kind of situation and he kind of warned us in advance we ought to deal with it, how to recognize it and how to deal with it. It's in Matthew 11, where the, the peoples are saying, hey, we have piped unto thee, but you have not danced. And we've mourned unto thee, but you haven't lamented. In other words, we said, here, let's go do this. And you didn't follow us. You know, we said, this is what all faithful Israelites should do. And you're not doing what we're doing. And so there's always this call to action uh, and of various kinds. And for some reason, you know, Jesus isn't following their pattern. He's staying straight and true with what his mission is. And therefore, he's not letting his enemies set his agenda for him. A phrase I use, that Dr. Richter used often in his own life. 
He wasn't going to let his enemies set his agenda for him. He wasn't going to set political things, set the agendas for him either. So we need to actually have a single-mindedness, a one-mindedness on God's kingdom. Seek it first. And there shouldn't be too much room for other kingdoms in that light unless they are already subservient to God's kingdom. So when people say, you know, Christians should get on board with this thing and you need to sign that document and this resolution and that charter and uh, boycott this. And if you're not doing any of these things and you're less than you're on Satan's side, this is the kind of argumentation that Jesus rejected. That if you're following what God requires, you don't do not need to be concerned with all these political polls left and right, because they were just at that. They were measuring your fitness as a citizen based on your compliance with their uh, flow, flowing from one direction, one to the other. And Jesus said, no, we're going to be like the rock in the stream that uh, that stops things from uh, eroding away and stops the decay and stops this uh, every window doctrine being moved around. We shouldn't be st- the solid ones. The solid- there should be a solidity in where the Christian stands. And we need to therefore take that stand and stand there for all goodness, for goodness sake, as opposed to simply say, well, maybe it's kind of hot here in the kitchen. I better get out of it again. Jesus was willing to take the heat because he was standing in the right place in the first place. So if you stand on the word of God, there's no reason for us to be worried about the political winds because they come and go. Every single election is the most important election in the universe. And uh, unless you wind it back in time. And then all of a sudden we see the folly of it, but we don't see the folly of it, the thing that's right in front of us because there's a lot of static in the atmosphere. And man's arrogance is that Whatever's going on right now is the most important thing. It's the snob, it's called chronological snobbery. What's going on now is what's really important, and history can be neglected because focus on the now. Whereas, what does Isaiah say? Look unto the rock from whence you were dig, look to the quarry from whence you were uh, shoveled out, right there. I think it's in Isaiah 54. Look unto Abraham and Sarah. In other words, look backward to your source so you know where you're going. And so we need to therefore look to Christ, the foundation stone. And the foundation that was built on that with the uh, the apostles and build on that, not and then that's faithfulness there is going to count. Faithfulness in the political party is not going to count in God's book. It, seriously, it's not. I hate to tell you this, but it's the wrong path, the wrong method. And that's why there's some time spent in Isaiah 8 warning about conspiracies that God had to put a strong hand on Isaiah so he wouldn't be too worried and, and being flexed left and right with all these people saying, do this, do that. Worry about that. Be concerned over this, as opposed to staying so focused on what God requires that your task will be completed, as opposed to being diverted because you're worried about all these other things, all the concerns of life that can congest and choke out how God's kingdom is to grow in your personal life, in the life of those people around you, and institutions that you have an influence on. So it has to be so God-centered that the things of man become a secondary issue entirely, except as they touch upon your need to serve, uh, your need to be a, a, an ambassador, to stretch out the hand to the needy, as Proverbs 31 says of the woman who's uh, a wonderful wife, etc. There's other missions, but those are where we take charge. In other words, we then see and deal with things that God brings to us. But that's not the same thing as being bashed back and forth, because it's the arrogance of those who are demanding that we dance when they pipe. And demanding that we lament when they mourn. Jesus drew attention to that and said, don't be swayed. And uh, because their claims that you should be swayed are themselves arrogant. And they show they do not have faith in the triune God. They have faith in the word and actions of man. And when you put your faith in man, you are already condemned. Because putting your faith in horses and chariots gets you nowhere. Putting your faith in God gets you everywhere. Right. So, Mark, one of the things your father um, really brought to light for me, um, I think it's in his lectures on the Sermon on the Mount, where he talks about what meekness is. I- I've heard people criticize the attitude that Martin just described and explained as, oh, I see. So you're just giving up and you're just going to pray and do nothing. And you bring up the providence of God, the predestination of all things. And it's easy to re- Reduce that to, I see, so you're going to do nothing. But that's not what meekness means. What does it mean? Well, um, a biblical meekness that Jesus was referring to will actually lead to a boldness before men, because what he said was that uh, the meekness is not meekness before men or a personality trait. It was being um, meek before God. It was knowing who God was knowing our responsibility and our obligation uh, to serve God. 
And so the meek have a correct understanding of who God is. And this is this is sorely lacking even in the church today, because many people today, even in the church, think of God as someone who is just there to provide us an escape from hell. And it's a it's a very one dimensional, limited view of God. And he's of, of other than that, attitudes are, are vague and, and, and varying in the church about God. We don't have a good doctrine of God. If you look at most systematic theologies, one of the first chapters, often the first, is the doctrine of God. In other words, you can't understand man, you can't understand anything unless you understand who God is. And God is the ultimate authority, and man is responsible to God. So if you're meek before God, if you have a proper attitude of humbleness to God, which is going to involve obedience, then you can be bold before men to say, this is who I am, this is what I believe, and why I believe it. My dad used to use a a phrase now and then called epistemological self-consciousness. Epistemology is is the uh, study of uh, how we know things. So epistemological self-consciousness was being self-aware of what you believe and why. And if you're meek before God, that's your basis for this self-consciousness of who you are and why you believe what you believe and why you do what you do. And so yeah. that was the context in which, you know, of his phrases on uh, meekness. So, Martin, one of the things that Rush Juni says is it means broken to harness. So he compares it to the difference between being a wild stallion and a horse that can be useful. What's our harness? What's the harness that we're to be broken to? I would say it's the word of God itself, specifically the moral component, which would be the law of God. If we are mastered by the law of God, then God has mastered us, and we are fit to master the parts of the world that come under our hand and under our legitimate authority uh, to bring it into subjection to God and to give it to him as a gift as we cast our crowns at his feet. That's the, the mechanism. And the Greek word praus has also been, which is translated me, can also mean uh, power under control, under restraint. The restraint, again, and that harness component is that it's the word of God, the law of God, that is the restraining factor, um, that we won't seek our own, but we'll seek God's interest in a thing as he's articulated in his word to us. And that we don't appeal to our own self uh, values, if you will, but to God's values alone. And that's what what meekness is. It is a power under restraint or broken to harness uh, in the sense that there's power there, but it is not loose power that goes where it wills. It rather, it is under control of God and God, the mediator here is the law of God. It mediates our relationship to a fellow man. Uh, and therefore, there should be no arrogance between us and our fellow man. And as a consequence of no arrogant approach to God. Uh, and I think this is the essence uh, of what meekness is. And it's like you said earlier, it's not an emotional state of being obsequious <laughs> uh, uh, or wimpy. Uh, I'll pay you Thursday for a hamburger today kind of thing, <laughs> but rather that it is power, but it's under control. The, the man of God is a powerful man, but his power is channeled in a much more direct way to God's purposes, which means the things he does will last. You know, His works will follow him because exactly of that, whereas the humanists, all their stuff is going to end up being chaffed, that's blown away, and no place is found for them. What a big difference there is. So the arrogance, arrogant people will actually lose everything that they're trying to grasp for. And the meek person will keep and retain everything that he has labored for in the Lord. Because their labor is not in the vain. And like I said earlier, hand of the diligent shall bear rule. And the diligent man is someone who is meek. He is, his power is under restraint and control because the word of God guides and shapes his soul, his actions, his loves. Is uh, filled his affections is even it's right there in Psalm 19. Teach me right affections, O Lord, because I love your law. So even what we love can be dictated and garnered and harnessed by God's law and regulated by it. We should. There's nothing really that the law of God doesn't touch. Uh, that's why the same psalmist said, "I've seen an end to all perfection, but uh, 
thy commandment is exceeding broad, meaning it expands and covers everything. Yes. And uh, this is what exactly what the arrogant man denies. He thinks his will expands and covers everything, and God's law is a little micro island that has no significance to him. In reality, it's the arrogant man who's the little teeny island who's meaningless. Right. So thank you, gentlemen. I think we have um, given people stuff to think about. Let me encourage our listeners to get the three-volume set, Faith in Action, and go to your table of contents or the index and look up humanism. You'll see that Dr. Rush Dooney had an awful lot to say on the subject. And then the new commentary that I mentioned, Zephaniah, Haggai, and Zechariah, you know, I don't I don't know exactly when he wrote that mark, but I'm so glad it's in print. And uh it's it's a it's a very timely message for us because I'm not sure that we're in too dissimilar a situation. All right. Thank you, listeners, for joining us. We'll talk to you next time. <laughs>